Welcome back to another week on the trail. I'm Doc, and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right. I am excited to welcome this week's guest to the pod. Jamie Compass is a well-traveled adventurer who has taken his experience and created an incredible trail resource for the rest of us, his website, Down the Trail. Welcome to the pod, Jamie. Hey, thanks. It's good to be here, Doc. Absolutely. So you, you've had extensive time on the trail, so I'm assuming that you do have a, a trail name. I do. It's uh, Duct Tape. Duct Tape. That is outstanding. That's, that's one of the better ones we've heard. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but on the pod, we, we have a strict rule of referring to each other by trail names. So are you okay with me talking, talking to Duct Tape tonight? Yeah, that's all right. Excellent. Excellent. I've heard that for a, a bit. <laughs> That's, that's how we keep connected to the trail. We try and bring it all back. All right. Hey, have you listened to the pod at all? I have. Okay. So you may be familiar with a regular feature that we have on the pod, and it's called the Pro Tip Insight of the Week. So towards the end of the episode, I'm going to turn to you. I'm going to say, hey, Duct Tape, what is your Pro Tip Insight of the Week? What can you share with our listeners that's going to make their next outdoor experience even better? So some, some wisdom, some insight, a tip or a trick. Uh, so don't be surprised when I, when I ask you that question towards the end. All right, got it. Okay, very good. We've also added a new feature season two, and that is our must bring gear review. When you're out on the trail, what is it? What are the, what are the, what's a necessary, one of your favorite items that you have to bring? And do you have a favorite brand? or make of that, uh, that particular item and why? Um, well, historically, I, I had a favorite hoodie. Um, it didn't really have much of a brand to it. I don't even remember the brand name or the tag on it, um, but I got it at a Kohl's department store and it was just a, a fleece hoodie, really basic, navy blue, but it came with me on so many great trips. Um, it was an essential part of my pack for about 10 years um, as my basic, just warm layer. Um, in addition to that, I used it as my pillow all the time. So that's a pretty intimate item. It was a personal favorite. Um, more recently, uh, my girlfriend, she went to REI and comes back with a couple of camp pillows. The new, the new ones that you blow up, uh, they're Sea to Summit brand. And I saw that and I thought, oh, that's extra weight. You know, I'm not going to carry that. I, I'm just going to use something else because gear should have uh, two uses, right? At least two different things, multi-use gear. But um, I gave it a try and I thought, huh, well, this is really nice. Um, so I, I started bringing that. And this was a short time after I had retired that hoodie anyway, so it was well-timed. And um, after a bit, I realized that I could actually save weight by using the pillow because instead of using like one of my clothing layers as my pillow, I'd have that extra layer to wear in my sleeping bag at night. So I could get away with carrying a lighter sleeping bag and actually save weight in the end. There you go. Clever. <laughs> yeah. So you're not the only guy out there. I, so I guess I'm not the only guy out there also worried about, you know, dual purpose items and weight and how we're going to, how we're going to pull this off without carrying a 35 pound pack. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, I do have a, a hyper light backpack. I just got a few years ago. I, I really love their brand and all their stuff. I, I even have their little wallet. <laughs> wow that, yeah, that's a really uh, neat little wallet um again like if you're going on a longer trip you don't want to carry your whole wallet so instead of having to take out my id and stuff i've kind of simplified my wallet using that and i can just throw that in my pack all right let's get down to how hardcore you are do you also drill holes in your toothbrush no i refuse no. To, to cut off the handle of my toothbrush <laughs> absolutely not all right. Good. If you ask me that, that's one of my uh, kind of pet peeves about going ultralight. 
or the mark. That, that's kind of we lost it. <laughs> that, that's kind of the benchmark for you know how wh what edge of the spectrum is this guy on. So that's good to know. <laughs> All right. And you have a fantastic section on your website uh, related to gear and you go through your current list of gear. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're already starting to talk about gear. That's always a favorite topic of mine. And we'll get to it a little bit later in the episode. I'd love to hear, uh, just kind of take us through the list and uh, maybe some highlights from the list and what your pack weighs out at. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't get too crazy about it, about my gear. So I don't even have a recent base weight for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't Very have good. an ounce scale at home. Yeah. No ounce scale. Okay. No. no ounce scale and full toothbrushes noted. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Got it. All right. Hey, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit and just start with kind of your background growing up, family, and how did you get hooked in the whole outdoor experience? Uh-huh. Um, well, I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania originally, um, which is about 30 miles from the Appalachian Trail. Uh, but the thing is, I had never even spent a single night in the outdoors until I was 19 years old. And by then I had decided that I wanted to do the entire Appalachian Trail. Um, throughout my teens, I had heard of the Appalachian Trail and knew that it was um, nearby. And it just kind of blew my mind that you could walk through the mountains all the way uh, you know, to Maine or Georgia and in between. And it just kind of sat in my subconscious. Um, similarly, um, it was in the eighth grade, uh, one of my school teachers just took this period informally to um, tell us about his bicycle trip across the United States. He went from the East Coast all the way to uh, Colorado. And that really struck my imagination because I was really into cycling at that time. I was about 14 and me and my best friends would go out every weekend and go for miles and miles. Um, our mothers hated it because we'd be on busy roads and just be gone all day. Uh, but we loved it just exploring, seeing where the, where the roads went. Um, so by the time I was out of high school, I pretty much had a bucket list already. I knew that I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail and I knew that I wanted to ride a bicycle across the country and I also wanted to run a complete marathon. And I ended up doing all three of those things by the time I was 25. Nice, which marathon did you run? Uh, Philadelphia. It ends at the, uh, the art museum there in downtown Philadelphia where Rocky goes up the steps. Nice. That's awesome. And how, how was your, uh, how was your time? Uh, that one was five hours. Uh, I was 20 years old though. Um, I got it down to about four hours though, more recently. Very good. Very good. That's a, that's an hour quicker than I ever did. So yeah. congratulations. <laughs> Very good. So uh, what is your day job and how do you fund your adventures? Um, well, Let's see, I went, after high school, I went to a, a single semester of, of college and I was paying for it. Uh, it was just community college and I didn't really know what I was doing there. didn't have direction for it. So after that one semester, I was just like, screw this. I'm gonna save money and go hike the Appalachian Trail. So I was working as a line cook um, at a local restaurant. And so I just picked up more hours doing that and I pretty much stuck in food and beverage my entire adult career. Um, it wasn't until sometime later that I discovered kind of the beauty of, of seasonal jobs in national parks. Because um, you can go to places like Grand Canyon where I went or most national parks or places like ski resorts and get a seasonal job and work only a few months in a great place. And these places, they put you up with employee housing so you can do well because you have a really low cost of living there if you can deal with kind of moving around regularly. And I really kind of found my niche with that. Um, I really kind of love the seasonal work. Uh, for the last five years, I was primarily at the north rim of Grand Canyon in the summers. But I also worked up in Denali National Park in Alaska. Um, I've worked at the south rim. 
Uh, just last summer, I worked at Bryce Canyon in Utah. Wow. There are worse places to work, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have done a bit of tour guiding too, but uh, primarily food and beverage. Okay. Tell us about the tour guiding. Where, where, would you, where were you a tour guide? Um, at the south rim of Grand Canyon, I drove uh, Jeep tours where I would, I would take folks around the rim of the canyon and just talk about Grand Canyon, let them see the sights, get the selfies and so on. That sounds incredible. That's a, that's a fantastic job. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 It's just great working, living and working in the parks or, you know, in just ideal locations like that. Right. And so I know that you have a love for the Grand Canyon and some long hikes, uh, in and about the, the Grand Canyon. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but did that, uh, when you first started working there, was that your first experience with the Grand Canyon? It was. Yeah. Um, I got a job. Um, well, I was in Pennsylvania and interviewed for it from Pennsylvania and was hired and traveled out there. And the day I checked in for, for work to human resources, there was the first time I saw the Grand Canyon. And it, it didn't really impress me at first sight, to be honest. You know, now everyone has these stories about how they, they get into tears and stuff, but I just kind of looked at it and thought, huh, well, yeah, that's, that's really neat looking. It, it didn't look real, you know, but um, later that night I went out for sunset and that's kind of when it really hit me, when the light started changing and the shadows and all the reds and colors came out, it was just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I've never been there myself. I need to get out there. Yeah, it's an awesome place. Maybe we can coordinate. You can give me a tour. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about uh, your website, Down the Trail. How, what, what was the inspiration for that? And how did that come to be? And let's talk about some of the features on it. Um, well, when I hiked the Appalachian Trail, that was back in 2000 or 2001 and 2002. So I kept a journal online on uh, trailjournals.com, which is still online. I don't know if you've seen it. And then later when I did my bicycle tour, I, I kept a, a journal online on a site called crazyguyonabike.com, which is basically like trailjournals.com, but for uh, bicycling tourists. And then a few years later, um, I got into MySpace. You remember MySpace before Facebook? I, I've heard of it, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, to kind of play with your profile there, you had to do a little bit of coding, um, which I kind of looked up and managed to do j just to make the small changes on it. But once I got started doing that, I thought, you know, maybe I could make my own website because there was more to it back then. Uh, to having a site. You had to know at least a little bit of code. Um, so I, I launched downthetrail.com in about 2008 um, just to move my journals to my own space. And I, I had done the long trail then in Vermont in 2007, so I wanted to put up my own style of a journal for that on there. And it just kind of grew from there. I kept doing journals, but eventually I thought, well, you know, most people don't care to read about hiking. You know, just, oh, I got up, I had a Pop-Tart for breakfast, I, I walked X amount of miles, things were pretty, I met this person, and so on, went to town, had a pizza, drank beer, uh, there was a big hill, etc. You get the point. So I, I started focusing more on, on kind of the readers and started doing more trail guides, especially for my, my smaller trips, like weekend hikes and so on. Um, so that's what I'm still doing. I, I have a lot of uh, backlog on this site to catch up on. The, the problem is I've always done more hiking than, than working on the site. Um, but I am starting to catch up and, and get a lot more stuff onto it, primarily trail guides. Um, you mentioned my gear page. Uh, I do talk about gear on the site, but it's actually just one long kind of epic page. It's actually about like 8,000 words. Yeah, it, it's it's quite the yeah. quite the page. Uh, but I do want to start doing indi individual reviews, um, and I still do have trail journals on there, of course, and just whatever else is on my mind related to the outdoors. Sometimes I'll review a book, or um, 
and just talk about outdoor issues like leave no trace related things and so on. Right. And looking at your gear list, I've got it up here right now. I mean, you do have all of your items there and you do have the weight next to each one of the items. Uh -huh. So uh, you've got the Hyperlite Southwest 3400 large, which clocks in at uh, 32 ounces. Uh -huh. Good solid backpack. Yeah, absolutely. Very happy with that. Yeah. Okay. You use the uh, Big Agnes Copper Spur HVUL2. Uh huh. Um, that's my my couple's tent that I use uh, with my girl. Okay. Um, but I have used Big Agnes tents primarily for probably the last decade. But like like the Fly Creek, I like to um, like their like the two man Fly Creek is probably my favorite solo tent. All right. And you've got your Marmot Hydrogen sleeping bag. What's uh -huh. that rated down to? Um, it's rated at 30. You know, it's okay. more traditional to have a 20 degree bag, but, uh -huh. but it's a really light sleeping bag. And that kind of gets back to that camp pillow I was talking that's about. That's right. Uh-huh. Yeah. So there's that, that sleeping bag. Of, of feathered friends, a 20 degree bag, but I haven't really been able to, to justify that yet. Okay. So yeah, the Marmot Hydrogen comes in at 23 ounces and the, the inflatable pillow is only three ounces. So right there, you can, you can wear that jacket instead of sleeping on it. For sure. Very good. And you know what I found, I, I found an inflatable pillow to be uh, preferable to a uh, stuffed up jacket into a either, you know, by itself or in a, in a stuff sack. I just, it, it didn't, it never worked out for me quite right. And then you go with the Thermarest Z Light for your sleeping pad. Uh huh. Yeah, I like the uh, just the the foam sleeping pads. Mm -hmm. I did have an inflatable Thermarest on the Appalachian Trail, but once I started hiking more in the desert, I just I like the the flexibility of having something that's foam and you don't have to really worry about so much. Yeah, and your stove. I mean, you can't beat the weight on your stove. Three ounces. The MSR Pocket yeah. Rocket Two. Mm hmm. I mean, you can, like with denatured alcohol, maybe, but then you lose efficiency a little bit. I did use a Pepsi can stove on the Appalachian Trail and a couple of subse subse subsequent hikes, for sure. You know, the, the guys that use Pepsi can stoves, they're the ones that, that uh, drill holes in their, their toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it, tell us about your journals on the website. What do your journals consist of? Um, just my, my trail journals for longer hikes. Uh, like I said, it started with the Appalachian Trail. Um, I have my entire, uh, bicycle touring journal on there. Um, next I, I have the, the journal from the Long Trail, Vermont. Um, that was the first one where I kind of put a lot more care into it. Uh, because I, that was the first one I posted on my own site, so I was able to um, put like the pictures exactly where I wanted them in relation to the text instead of having like a block of text and a mm -hmm. bunch of photos. And when that went online, that was one of the, the earlier journals that kind of had that sort of format. And then there's also the, the Colorado Trail, which I did in 2010 is on there. Um, I also have a, a trip from Alaska on there from Denali. Um, I'm missing a John Muir trail journal. I, I never really wrote one on the trail for that. That's why I've been slow to get that one online. But I, I have some great photos from it. I was really focusing on photography. Uh, but uh, that, that hike on the John Muir trail was pretty uneventful. Um, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, like I was talking about trail journals before, um, it, it didn't rain like a single day. Or maybe uh -huh. it rained once, but blue skies the whole time. Just perfect trip like hiker heaven <laughs> nice you know when you were describing uh, you know traditional hiker journals about you know i climbed a hill and i went into town and i, I did this that's pretty much you just you described the podcast here so i, I hope <laughs> yeah. that uh, our listeners are hanging in <laughs> and it's all epic <laughs> <laughs> very good so hey you know what our our listeners are very familiar with the john muir trail as you might imagine listening to the john freaking muir pod we, we try and, and and talk about that uh, at least once an episode so um let, let's do an impromptu top five list here what, what were your top five moments from the the jmt your jmt hike um moments from the jmt hike 
Oh, that's really impromptu. Yeah, it could be campsites. It could be, uh, it could be beautiful sites. It could be river crossings, you know, whatever you want to share that you, that just popped to your head from your trip. Uh-huh. Um, probably hiking up Muir Pass in the dark popped into my mind first. Were you going northbound uh, or southbound? Southbound. Okay. Because uh, we encountered a ranger that afternoon. And he said, oh, that there's a storm coming, you know, you, you better kind of stay put and hunker down. It's going to be a big snowstorm. Uh, we, we hiked the JMT in September, by the way, starting in early September and finishing later in the month. It was a three-week trip. Um, but yeah, that kind of gave us some pause. Uh, this is in 2009, so we didn't have any connectivity or anything. We didn't exactly have a satellite device to check the weather and confirm what he said. But Back you know, in the dark ages, ages of 2009. Wow. <laughs> so we, uh, we went through kind of the, the worst case scenarios and so on because we wanted to get up and over the pass. Uh, so, so we went ahead and hiked up there that night. Um, so that was just, it just popped into my mind because... I just have this memory of, uh, I, I hiked with two other folks and they were, they got a good ways ahead of me. They were probably like half mile ahead of me at least, but I could see their headlamps, but it gave me a feeling of solitude of just being out there at night, like way up above tree line, approaching Muir Pass, you know, the wind's kicking up, the stars are gorgeous. And that was just a nice moment. Okay. That that does sound epic. So did you miss uh, Wanda Lake in the daytime? Did, was it dark when you went by Wanda? Uh, it was the sun was just setting. Yeah, yeah, that's one that's one of the more that's that's one of the prettiest sites on the trail. I think is Wanda that Wanda Lake area. I really love the uh, just the the desolate feel. High Alpine Lake uh, just really strikes a chord in me. Um, next that comes to mind is of, Kurt, of course the first day we did a half dome. Uh, which kind of is an exciting experience anytime. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, unless, unless you live in Yosemite, I suppose, and do half dome all the time. But uh, that was really neat for us. It was my first time to uh, Yosemite National Park, and it, it's just a cool hike, a great day. Yeah, let me ask you something about Half Dome. Have you, what, what did you hear about Half Dome, or what did you know about Half Dome and the hike up to the top of it prior to getting there? Um, I knew about the cables. I'd okay. seen some photos, um, but I had done like Angel's Landing in Zion National Park, which is kind of notoriously similar in that regard. Um, but yeah, I was I wasn't really worried about the cables section so much. And was um, there was there yeah. snow at that time in September? On Not Hector? really September. There was okay. a lot of smoke actually. There was a big fire. We actually had to drive all the way around because we dropped a car down at Whitney Portal and we had to go all the way up, uh, I th think around, it was called Sanium Pass, north of Yosemite, um, instead of going in the east entrance, uh, which brought us a long way out of the way. Um, that's but quite, that, that's, that that's quite day, a journey in itself yeah. to, start your, to start your trip. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the, the waterfalls were great going up the mist trail that day. And then to cap it off, at the end, we camped um, at that first campsite. I think it's called Sunrise or Sunset mm -hmm. at, the, at the base of the Half Dome intersection. And we got there pretty early. So um, I was in good shape and all, all excited to be out there. So, so I went up to uh, Clouds Rest that evening for sunset. And uh, there wasn't anyone else up there. And that, that was really nice experience up there so is that number three um sure okay all right <laughs> yeah. yeah that can be number three uh let's see number four um you know what just we we're taking a break one day having a snack and there's big trees in california right <laughs> especially along the jmt those big sugar pines and even some sequoias and so on and this huge pine cone comes crashing down like there was like a bomb debris of needles from where it landed just with a big pow it hits the ground and then immediately afterward there's a chatter of a red squirrel up there basically laughing at us like it had dropped it there on purpose just to give us a good little scare 
Did you guys jump? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, at, at Red's Meadow, j just the meal there. I remember we had, it, yeah. it, that's the first stop, I think. Uh, you know, first good meal along the way sticks in your mind. I had a burger. And I want to say, going in, in, the, in the restroom there, there was some graffiti in the bathroom that said, Hey Duke lives. Uh, you might have seen that around. It's an, it's an Ed Abbey reference, and you, you tend to see it all over the place, and that, that just sticks in my mind because you tend to see it everywhere, and it's what? a fun little reference. I don't really approve of graffiti, but... Yeah, tell, tell me again or tell our listeners what the reference is to. Um, it, it refers to a, a character called George Hayduke uh, from an Edward Abbey novel called The Monkey Wrench Gang. Uh, which is a great book. It, it's fiction, but it, it's a whole lot of fun. It, it's basically about some eco-terrorists in the 1960s who go around sabotaging bulldozers and so on in the Utah desert because they disapprove of development in the wilderness. All right. And, and that touched people to it called Hey Duke Lives. Got it. And that's that the uh, origin of the Hey Duke Trail in Utah. You beat me to it. That's what I was going to say. The Hey Duke Trail. We're going to uh, talk about that a little bit later in the episode because I don't think I've had on the podcast anybody who has done the Hey Duke Trail. So I'm interested to hear your perspective and, and your experience on that trail. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's talk about your first backpacking trip. Is, it, is that um, when you got hooked on the whole experience of through hiking? And what, what was that all about? Um, so let's see, going back to, uh, my desire to hike the Appalachian Trail, I thought, well, I want to do this thing. I guess I better learn how to go backpacking. Now, I didn't really know anyone that was into backpacking or even car camping, really. So I had a lot to learn, but I went online and, and read a bunch of things and got some gear. I got a backpack, uh, and a Gregory Shasta pack which was eight pounds empty. And I did hike the entire Appalachian Trail with that pack. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple of my buddies uh, that the summer after I graduated high school, they went on a, like a three day trip on the, on the Appalachian Trail. And so the next summer I talked guys into kind of taking me and another one of our friends out for a few nights to do this hike so I could learn about backpacking. Um, his name was Mike. My other uh, buddy that came with us was uh, Dave, actually a good friend of mine. Um, so we started out, well, let me backtrack a bit. We get to the trailhead, okay? Park there, it's midsummer. It's like July or August. It's really hot, humid in Pennsylvania. And a thunderstorm comes. And it's pouring rain when we pull up at the trailhead, just pouring buckets. It's a good start. So we're kind of naive there and we're sitting in the car and we think, well, it's pouring rain, but we're going to go be rugged outdoors men and we're going to have to learn to deal with this sort of thing. So what do we do but get out of the car in the pouring rain <laughs> and start hiking? And that what year, what year is this and how old are you? Uh, 2000 it was a summer of 2000 and so those are my first steps backpacking just in the pouring rain getting soaked the trail's like a river um i don't remember if i had waterproof boots or not but it didn't matter at that point um i don't think they were waterproof but anyway the, the rain only lasts for a couple hours but we're completely drenched now, a few days later, um, Dave was kind of a little bit slower than, than, than Mike and I, but um, we kind of stop and wait for him. And on that third day, um, we're at this uh, uh, highway crossing where the trail crosses a, a road. And uh, we had like a, a lunch with, with Dave and we say, hey, we're going to go to the, this next spot. And... Um, we'll, we'll wait for you there, you know, instead of just 
kind of going slower. So we do that. Uh, Mike and I get to this spot. It's a it's Hurtline campsite for those of the listeners that are familiar with the AT. They're in Pennsylvania, and we were going to stay at the 501 shelter that night. So we get to the site and we start waiting. An hour goes by, two hours, three hours, I think. I, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but we so were starting just to, starting to sound like a Bill Bryson novel. Yeah, getting worried. So, and we're like, what happened to him? Did, did the Blair Witch get him or, or what? You know, he just disappeared. Like, did he get lost off the trail or get kidnapped or something? Who knows? Like, our minds just started racing. Uh, so, we backtracked all the way back to the road where we had last seen him, and there's no sign of him. Uh, we talked to one other hiker coming toward us, and, and he hadn't encountered anybody. So we, yeah, exactly. He just disappeared. So we have another like hopeless kind of meeting there. Like Mike and I just a discussion like, okay, so what do we do now? Keep duct in tape, mind. Duct uh, tape, I really hope that this has, this story has a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. It, it does for the most part. So we're like, well, what do we do? You know, we're exhausted. We're not about to hike all the way back to 501 shelter. We got blisters, heavy packs, it's 90 degrees. So we're like, well, let's just hitchhike to town and call for help. So we hitchhike down the hill, uh, check into a room, and then we get on the phone and call the state police. I never even told this story for like 10 years until after it happened. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> so um, they send out full rescue squad, uh, you know, search and rescue goes all out looking for them. They bring guys in from all angles. Um, at one point uh, they picked up uh, Mike and I and took us to their like new little command center, their the trailhead. And, uh, Later that evening, they found him um, camped with some other backpackers at the Hurt Lion campsite. So what had happened was at some point, while we were waiting for him there on the trail, he managed to pass us without us noticing. Basically, he got there and he thought, oh, man, they, you know, they kept going. They, they got tired of waiting for me, so they must just kept going to the shelter for the night. So he hiked went all the way to 501 shelter. We weren't there. He freaked out, gets scared, goes back to Hurt Line, and by then it's dark. And so he got a little night hike experience. He wasn't counting solo and just stayed there for the night. Um, but yeah, it was just a disaster. Real embarrassing, but it's a good story. <laughs> that is a good story. And despite all that, you kept on backpacking. I mean, you, you have quite the, the backpacking resume. So you did, you did not let that get in your way. It didn't, didn't say, oh my gosh, you know, this, this, this is terrible stuff. I can't, I can't be doing this. You, you stuck with it. So, um, A short time after that, uh, that fall in September, I did go out for another trip um, just for three nights, just to make sure I, I knew what I was doing before heading down to Springer Mountain. And that was a solo trip, <laughs> just to make sure I didn't get separated from anyone and just to ensure that wouldn't happen again. But after that, um, yeah, I went to Georgia the following spring and got on the Appalachian Trail. All right. Hold that thought right there. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hear about that trip on the AT. Stay tuned. And welcome back. We're talking with Duct Tape. Just heard about his uh, fantastic start to his backpacking career, calling out the state police. Did you ever get a bill from them? <laughs> uh, I don't believe so, no. Not that I ever heard of, at least. Very good. So I hope they're not listening, saying, oh, that's where we need to send the bill to. So don't just if you're listening and you're from the state police in Pennsylvania, don't, don't pay any, any <laughs> mind to this. Okay. All right. Hey, and we, we ended the last segment. You were just getting to the AT. And so how old are you in 2001? I'm 20 years old. 20 years old. You've got your eight pound backpack loaded up. You head down to Springer Mountain and you are set to go 
on a 2200 mile hike the adventure of a lifetime as a 20 year old were you, were you did you know what you were getting into um i did well i mean you never truly know but i, I knew as well as anyone could you could say um, now, now I have a, a story about my first days on, on the Appalachian Trail. I figured um, you might. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I was doing my research, um, I heard that the best shoes that you can get are, are the Vasque Sundown or leather boots. Waterproof, maybe you've heard of them, Italian leather and so on. So before the trip, I, I, I got myself some of those. And there was one day prior to the hike where it was raining out and I thought, oh, it's a perfect day to, to break my shoes in. So I went and walked like a few miles around the neighborhood and, and called it good and broken in. Well, it turns out those, those shoes didn't really fit me that well. Uh, my very first day on the trail, um, they were too big basically. So every time I'd lift my foot, you would get that split seconds where, where the shoe stays on the ground until your heel comes up and rubs the back of the shoe to, to bring the shoe off the ground with your foot. So <laughs> I, I did the approach trail going up Springer Mountain and, and stayed on top that night. And I take my shoes and socks off and the, the first layer of skin, about a silver dollar size on both of my feet, came right off, didn't even, didn't even blister. So I thought, you know, I don't want to deal with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some moleskin on backwards so the sticky side um, isn't on the sore spot. And then I'm going to wrap duct tape around my ankle to kind of hold that moleskin in place. So that was my solution for both feet. And I keep hiking. Um, it took me another three days to get to the first uh, stop on the, on the Appalachian Trail. Um, that's at Neal's Gap. And in that entire time, I didn't even take my socks off because I knew I was just stubborn and I knew my heels were in bad shape and I didn't even want to look at them and didn't want to have to peel that tape off or anything i think that's what they call ostrich syndrome <laughs> you're just not going to look at the problem just let it be yeah i'm not familiar with that term <laughs> i like that though ostrich syndrome so anyway um so I, at neil's gap i think well i'm, I'm gonna have, i'm gonna go to town and get a shower and get some food and take a day off and and see what i'm dealing with here with my feet so I, I check into this cabin at a Goose Creek Cabins. I don't know if it's still there or not. Um, so I, I painstakingly peel my socks off and peel this tape off. And well, you can imagine it's just pus and blood. Like there's no skin anymore on either of my heels. Like again, about a silver dollar size on both feet. And then where the tape had been with, was just kind of sore, like a red sore. and. Um, on the top of my feet where the edge of the tape would hit the top of my foot, it even created little cuts just from like digging into my skin. Is this how you earned your trail name, duct tape? Yes, it is. Um, wow. Duct, <laughs> duct tape, I have to tell you, this is not an optimal, optimal start to a 2,200-mile trail. No, it was not. Um, so I was stuck at Goose Creek for, for a good while. I think it was about six days, six or seven days, almost a full week, which was really, really frustrating. All these other hikers came through, they're having a great time, and there I am just being miserable, staring at the red stripes on my feet, waiting for them to heal up. Um, and then one day I, I got up, or, or I decided, you know, tomorrow's a day, I'm just going to get back on the trail, I don't care, I'm just going to deal with it. And then I get up that morning. I remember it was Friday the 13th because someone took great pleasure in reminding me of that. And it's pouring rain that morning. But later that afternoon, it's like three in the afternoon, uh, the sun comes out, the weather clears. And I just thought, you know what, take me up there. I'm going to go for it. I'll just hike a mile in or whatever. So that's what I did. Um, I hiked in my flip flops, which I brought for camp shoes for that 
first few miles. Uh, the next day I hiked most of that day in those flip-flops until I started to get blisters between my big toe and, and second toe. Um, but uh, I just kept going, kept pushing. Um, it took another day until I kind of figured out that I could wear a second pair of socks to kind of make my feet bigger to kind of stop the irritation. I, I was really idiotic for not coming up with that sooner. Um, but that got me through until um, the Nantahala Outdoor Center where they sell shoes and then I got a new pair of shoes and I was pretty much good to go after that. So how far in is the, the, uh, that, sh that, uh, that center where you got the, the new shoes? How many miles into the hike was that? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, it's in North Carolina. Um, I want to say about 80 miles or so, but it's really a rough guess. Oof. That, that sounds like a really rough hike. There's 80 <laughs> miles to get there. That That is, I was, I had the, the uh, heebie-jeebies listening to you describe that because I know that if your feet, I mean, if you've got pain in your feet, the hike is no fun. I mean, yeah, every, it can every break moment. Up. Yeah. It's like number one, it's one of the number one things I, I tell new hikers is, you know, make sure you have good shoes and that you have your, your socks and your shoes just dialed in really well mm -hmm. and to, um, you know, get some weight on your back because shoes wear differently when you have some weight on your back as opposed to just walking around your local trail with a little day pack. Right. And what kind of shoes did you settle on? Um, well, they're discontinued now. I, uh, the brand was called Low, I believe, L. L O W E or no, it was Garmont. I'm sorry. The Garmont was a brand and I forget the, the model to be honest. But they was, were, it, was it another boot? Um, no, it was a, it, they were similar to today's uh, Merrill Moab ventilators, popular mm -hmm. shoes. Um, but yeah, they, they, they were low top, um, but they were kind of beefier. They, they had a nice Vibram sole. Got it. And um, so I noticed earlier uh, in the discussion, in the first segment, you mentioned that you, you said 2001 and 2002 doing the Appalachian Trail. So did you do the full trail twice or what happened there? Um, so I get up, uh, well, let me backtrack a bit. Um, I, I was kind of a slower hiker. Um, I took up because I took a lot of zero days. I did have some big mileage days. I, I did a, a fair number of, of 20s, but I was young. I get homesick. I, I liked my creature comforts and indulged a bit in the trail towns. You know, everyone does to some extent, but um, I let that kind of get me a little bit more backed up than I should. So um, I'm up in Vermont in September and most of my friends that I'd met on the trail are, are a good little ways ahead of me, about a week or two. Uh, th there were still some kind of stragglers, stragglers, but I was way at the back of the pack. So I still had about 500 miles to go to get to uh, Mount Katahdin before October 15th, as the listeners probably know is kind of the cutoff date to finish the AT going northbound. I had no interest in kind of flip-flopping or doing bits or pieces. I really wanted that continuity of going from Georgia to Maine, even if it meant that I wasn't going to make it that first year. Um, but I was, I was still plugging away, getting as far as I could, and um, I'm staying in uh, Manchester Center, Vermont, in a room there. It's a trail town. And um, I, I had taken a zero day, of course, <laughs> even though I didn't really have time to. That's just what I did. Uh, but um, I, I packed my bag the night before and I, I was real motivated to get on the trail the next day. And I wake up and I'm about to leave the room and I think, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna turn on the TV. I, I just had a feeling that, you know, uh, why not? You know, maybe for just like an hour, kind of relax and enjoy that last little bit of town. So I do that and it's September 11th, 2001. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. So 
I saw the, the second tower of the World Trade Center go, go down live on TV from Vermont after hiking there from Georgia. 20 years old, living the ideal trail life. So that was kind of a shock. It kind of, uh, yeah, it kind of hit my psyche pretty hard. Um, so I, I stayed there a few more nights, uh, just glued to the news. And then I thought, well, if I get a radio, then I'll be able to keep in touch with what's going on in the world. Cause no one really knew what was going to happen after that. It was kind of a scary time. We didn't know if we were going to go to war or what. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got a radio and then I, I hiked a, um, a night up Bromley Mountain and then I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm done. This is it. So I went back to town and took a bus back to Pennsylvania. Um, but um, after that, I kind of, I went back to work in my hometown and it just, it, it wasn't a good feeling not to have finished, you know, having unfinished business on the trail. So that very next summer, I went back and finished. Um, Vermont up to Katahdin and and that next year was great I made some really good friends in 2002 on the trail and I was 21 so I, I really got to enjoy the trail towns <laughs> <laughs> because when you were 20 you you, uh, you you of course followed all the rules of course yeah yes I, actually it. I did for the most part I was kind of you know I was kind of good I guess as far as that goes for the most part got it and do you, I was going to ask you about your, your trail family or your trail friends, if you, if you made any, any close relationships during the 2001, 2002, anybody you still keep in touch with? Um, there's a hiker named Yahtzee, his trail name. Um, I probably keep in touch with him the most, but I wouldn't even call it like a really close friendship. It's, it's just been kind of a touch and base on social media kind of thing. Got it. Um, yeah, but otherwise people go their own way. I, I have tried to look up a couple of the guys that I hiked with in uh, 2002, but it's it's kind of hard to find find them. Yeah. Right. Now I made reference to your trail resume a little bit earlier. Uh, how many miles do you think you spent on the trail? Have you ever added it all up? On the Appalachian Trail, or just all together? All together, all trails. Um, almost 10,000, I'd say. I have about um, 4,000 in the Grand Canyon alone. So I haven't done the PCT or the CDT, but when you add on the Appalachian and everything else, mm -hmm. it, it comes to almost 10,000, I'd say. Right, and any interest in doing the, the other two long trails and becoming a triple crowner? A little bit, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to do you want to speak it into existence right now and say that uh, when you're going to no. do those trips? No, I because because I've been there on the Appalachian and I kind of I learned what a really long backpacking trip is all about, and that was a long time ago. So if I really wanted to do those trails, I, I would have done them by now. Uh, maybe I will, you know, sometime in the future, but I just have different priorities these days, I guess. Got it. All right, here's a real treat for our listeners. Let's have a 40-year-old duct tape whisper in the ear of 20-year-old duct tape as he's getting ready to depart on the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> what advice would you give 20-year-old duct tape knowing what you know now? I gave it already. Break in your shoes. Uh huh. Um, also, uh, don't be so stubborn about not getting new gear. Uh, because I mentioned my backpack was eight like eight pounds empty. Um, I, I had, you know, a good bit of other heavy stuff uh, because kind of going ultralight was kind of a new fad at that time. And there was kind of like the, the old guard still around that kind of took a lot of pride in, in carrying a lot of heavy stuff and reliable, durable things. And I kind of subscribed to that a little bit too much. Um, so I just, I wish I'd got, um, cheaper gear starting out. Um, that's, that's one thing I write on my gear page to people just starting out, like, especially on the Appalachian Trail or even the PCT, maybe not the CDT because there's not as, as much supply on that one, but just get a bunch of crappy gear starting out. I, you might not even like hiking, you know, like, I don't know what the stats are these days, but the majority of people starting these through hikes still don't finish. 
Um, the completion rates have gone higher, but um, you know, don't, don't make that investment in the best gear right off the bat. Just get a bunch of a junk <laughs> as cheaply as you can and then start out on the trail. And if it's going well for you, then uh, these days you can just order new stuff online and have it sent to you to, in town or you can buy new stuff at Outfitters along the way. And by then you're experienced and you know a lot more about what you want and um, you can save a lot of money and frustration that way. Is there an item in, in anybody's pack that you would say, hey, spend top dollar on this particular type of equipment? If you're going to spend a little bit more, what, what, should, they, what should they spend it on? Um, the big three items, of course. Uh, those would be, uh, for those that aren't familiar with the term, your, your backpack, your shelter, and your sleeping bag. Uh, because those are the top dollar items and um, they're the heaviest items. Um, so you can save the most weight really quickly by upgrading those items. All right. Very nice. Not, it's not your pro tip. It's not that it doesn't count as your pro tip. You still have to come up with something else later in the episode. So I don't think you've gotten away from that. So, all right. Now you also have some experience seeing the country by bike. Is that correct? Uh huh. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, besides uh, uh, wearing off the skin on your feet in boots, I mean, how what 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 is the different pain riding a bike? Different different muscle sets, uh, different aches and pains. Um, a little bit. Uh, but this was 14 years ago now, when I did that that long bicycle tour. I, I haven't done a lot of bicycle touring since then. Um, so you tend to forget about the painful parts. <laughs> uh, but there weren't a lot of those. Probably the, the most painful thing for me was, was the maintenance issues, dealing with flat tires primarily and changing tubes on the side of the road and trying to figure all that out as I went. Because I'm not a bike mechanic. I'm not the handiest guy in the world, to be frank. So I, I had a lot of issues when it came to bike maintenance along the way. Did you just use a lot of duct tape on it? <laughs> no, that doesn't work so well <laughs> on those components. Dang it. Okay. So I mean, wh how, how many miles did you ride on this bike tour? And wh what, was, what was the starting point and the stopping point? Uh, it came up to about four to 5,000 miles, I'd say. I don't wow. recall exactly. I remember going coast to coast was about 3,000 miles. But I did a little bit of kind of roaming around on the West Coast afterward that added up some mileage. Um, I started at the Outer Banks, North Carolina. Uh, my family was going down to vacation there, so I thought, oh, perfect. I got my ride down to the um, general area of the East Coast I wanted to start at because uh, there's a route called the Trans America Trail. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, some of your listeners probably are. Yeah. We, in fact, a, a number of our listeners should be familiar with it because we had on a few episodes ago, Lael Wilcox, uh, who is That's a right. badass bike rider. And uh, uh, she was so fun to talk to. She talked about her 2016 Trans-American race um, that went from Oregon to Virginia. And, you know, it's 4,200 mile course. And she caught the, the, the male rider in the lead uh, from Germany. Stefan was his name. I remember it vividly because she did a great job describing it. She caught him at the end of a 4,200-mile bike race uh, with 100 miles to go to the finish line, basically, and uh, just ground him into the dust behind her and won the whole thing. Male or female, she was the winner of that race. It was a really cool story. Yeah, so um, I went up from Outer Banks to Yorktown, Virginia, picked up the Transamerica route, uh, which goes across Virginia. Um, I got to re revisit parts of the AT along the way there, um, into Kentucky, uh, Southern Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, turned up into Wyoming, um, up to Missoula, Montana, dipped through the panhandle of Idaho, and got to the uh, Pacific Coast in Oregon. Um, and then from there I went up to uh, Seattle 
Um, I, I just picked my own route to connect uh, Eugene, Oregon to Seattle. I went kind of up the Columbia River Gorge and went by Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens and went out to the coast. And then I rode the coast down to San Francisco because I wanted to finish at the Golden Gate Bridge. So once I got there, I, I uh, got my bike put in a box and flew back east and called it a, tri a trip. I did oh, you, didn't, you didn't turn around and ride it back? I did have some fantasies about doing that, um, about continuing down to San Diego and doing the southern tier of back east. Um, it's funny you mentioned turning around like that because I, I think at the beginning I mentioned um, I, I had a school teacher that had cycled across the country. Um, this was only about a year, you've got to remember, after the movie Forrest Gump came out. And there is, of course, that classic montage where <laughs> he runs across the country. And I got to say, that was, that was a solid inspiration for that trip. Um, yeah, it really struck a chord with me. <laughs> so do, do uh, touring bikers, do they get trail names as well? I mean, you could have been Forrest on that trip. <laughs> no, they don't, as far as I know. <laughs> Very good. That, I mean, that, that sounds like an epic trip. Did you have a favorite part of the U.S. that you saw on that, on that bike trip? Um, there's a couple. Um, I did really love that trip because it was my first time out west. Um, I had never been farther west than like Pittsburgh prior to that trip. So it kind of really opened my eyes to the whole country, you know, as you can imagine. Um, Wyoming overall was my favorite state. Um, just because it's empty and awesome. Um, it, it's the driest uh, state with the most desert, which is worth noting because it turns out that I would fall in love with the desert later moving to the Southwest uh, where I've been for the last 12 years or so. Um, Are you just saying that as an opinion or that is, that is known fact that uh, Wyoming is the driest with the most amount of desert? Um, Eastern Oregon has a lot of desert too. But as far as the, the Transamerica route goes, okay. uh, cycling, Wyoming, I'd, I'd guess that Wyoming and Eastern Oregon have the least precipitation. Yeah. Wow. I did not even realize that. That's interesting. Okay. Um, and of course, Wyoming has, has uh, the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone too. Um, an honorable mention though for my favorite area that's uh, notable because it's probably surprising to a lot of folks would be Kansas. Now, you know, you think of Kansas and riding a bike across it and, oh, that sounds horrible, right? It's just endless nothing. Uh, but again, coming from back east, uh, it just sort of blew my mind how far you could see. Um, I could see the, a grain elevator in the next town and the town's 15 miles away and I had never experienced anything like that before. And it, it was really beautiful in its own way. There's big sky, uh, you know, they say Montana's big sky country, but when the horizon's flat all around you, that's about as big as the sky can get. And people there were phenomenal too. Some of the nicest people in the, in the nation live in Kansas, in my experience. Yeah, I see a little bit of a parallel between your favorite state or honorable mention being Kansas with the, with the big sky and that earlier story you told about night hiking uh, up to Muir, just kind of the, you know, you're above the tree line and the desolation and the, the stars. Uh, I see a little bit of similarity between those two stories. Yeah. Nice. Nice. All right. Hey, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is the long trail in Vermont. Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've seen a documentary on that with uh, a woman trying to set the FKT on the long trail. I forget the title of it. It was a pretty intense documentary and she went through a lot trying to set that. I won't ruin the ending, but um, I've heard lots of things about the long trail and really wanted to hear kind of your experience and your impressions of it. Um, well, it does have a reputation for being really rugged, mm -hmm. which is well earned. Uh, it just has a lot of boulders and a lot of roots and rocks and a lot of mud. Um, probably the, the closest parallel to it would be the section of the Appalachian Trail in southern Maine and parts of New Hampshire where uh, most folks would agree is the hardest section of the Appalachian Trail. Is that the 100 mile wilderness? Um, no, it, it's farther south toward the New Hampshire border. It's got it. Um, yeah. 
Um, so on that trip, I went southbound uh, because I wanted to go in the fall and the, follow the, the fall colors changing from north to south. And I did succeed in that uh, fairly well with my timing on that. Um, for me, that was a really uh, kind of monumental trip in the way that after my bicycle tour, I kind of decided that I'm just going to keep doing this sort of thing and just keep going on adventures. You know, life is short. I'm just going to keep doing trails. And the long trail was the first one I picked out. It, it was somewhat local there in the Northeast and the timing was right. How long is the long trail? Uh, it's about 280 miles, I want to say. Okay. Um, it does get compared to the John Muir Trail a bit because um, because it's about the same length and similar seasons too are the best times to do them. Mm -hmm. And how, how long did it take you to do the long trail? Uh, I want to say between three or four weeks. I'd have to check my notes, but a little less than a month, I'd say. Um, the most notable thing about that trip I want to talk about is that um, I just kind of went off the grid for it. Um, again, in, in 07, uh, I was just, I think I had a flip phone then. Maybe I didn't have a smartphone yet. Um, this is still when folks would use like a calling card and go to a pay phone to keep in touch and you go to the library to check your email and so on. Yeah, I think um, the iPhone, I think the, the first iPhone came out in 2007. So uh -huh. yeah, it was, it was a rare breed who had a smartphone at that time. And even the <laughs> smartphones weren't that smart at that time. Um, so I made a point of just kind of trying to be out of touch. And to the extent that I wasn't going to check email or call anybody, but my mother, who I called twice, just to say, hey, I'm alive. Um, otherwise, I didn't have any interaction with anyone that wasn't like a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, additionally, I didn't even bring a watch. So I didn't know what time it was ever. I wanted to see what that was like. Just to kind of wake up when it was light out, whenever I woke up and just kind of watch the sky and do my best to set up camp before sunset, which didn't always work out. I ended up doing a bit of night hiking, <laughs> partially because of that, and uh, partially because the days get shorter then. But it was just a really nice experience out there, um, especially in that northern section of the Long Trail. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is the Long Trail in, the, in Vermont is the original long distance trail in the United States. It's the first. It was the inspiration for the Appalachian Trail. So it really has a lot of history behind it and you can kind of get a sense for that as you walk it and stay in these shelters. Um, I had a lot of them to myself because it was later in the season and it did rain a lot, but it was just really pleasant to just like, you know, have a shelter to myself and listen to the rain at night and, um, you know, not be watching the clock or counting my miles too closely and so on. It's just a nice trip and fall colors too, for sure. And so share with us, how, how does being off the grid for three to four weeks at a time, how does that change a person? What, uh, what differences do you notice in yourself? Um, just living in the moment more so is kind of how I would sum it up. It's kind of a hard kind of thing to describe how that would change you. It's kind of intangible, I'd say. Yeah. I want to touch on that just for a second, living in the moment, because here I am, I'm 53. I think you're around 40 or so, right? Uh-huh. And, you know, when you're little, when you're, you know, eight, 10 years old, you're always looking forward, right? Uh, I'm looking forward to high school. I'm looking forward to when I can drive. I'm looking forward to when I'm 18. I can't wait till I'm 21. I can't wait to find out what college I go to, what career I'm going to have. And you're always looking forward as a, as a child. And then you reach a point in your life, uh, maybe about this time in my life, where you start looking backwards. You're like, oh, man, remember the good old days? Remember when we did this? Remember when we had this experience? Remember how great that was? And you're looking backwards. And there is, there is an art to uh, living in the moment. So you're not looking forward and you're not looking back. You're, you're 
living in the moment and appreciating what's happening as it's happening. And I think I, I didn't realize that until after, you know, I had, I had passed that point and now I'm, I'm kind of looking backwards. So uh, just some advice for our listeners out there, especially our younger listeners. Uh, don't, don't let that happen. Uh, you know, live in the moment, appreciate the moment, enjoy what's going on as it's happening. So I, I got a, a great point that you, you, you bring out. Life on the trail is simple. You have a simple goal each day. You're hiking from point A to point B. You know, you're, you're, you're eating your food, you're packing up, you're, you're uh, setting up camp, you're breaking camp, and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it all strips away to, to a, a, a simpler form of life. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it's all about on the trail and the outdoors in general. All right. Hey, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, I know that you have a, a huge love for the Grand Canyon. I want to talk about the Grand Canyon with you for a little bit. And I also want to talk about uh, the Hayduke Trail and maybe Denali, if we, can, if we could squeeze it into our third segment. So stay tuned for that. A lot of good stuff coming up. Be right back. All right. Welcome back. We're talking to Duct Tape about his extensive hiking resume and covering some trips that we haven't previously covered on this podcast. And let's talk a little bit about your time in Denali. I know you, you had a, a seasonal job up there. And what kind of experiences did you have up in Denali? That's, that's kind of an epic place in my mind with some epic wildlife. Um, yeah, you nailed it. Uh, Denali is an awesome park. And it's really an ultimate backpacking destination. Um, no matter where you go in that park, you're going to have a great hike. Um, the wildlife is phenomenal. Like, you see grizzly bears everywhere, black bears, moose, uh, caribou. Um, there was a trip where I even saw a wolverine kind of loping along. Um, glacial river valleys, great mountain peaks, tundra, great views. That's awesome up there. Long days too, <laughs> short nights in the summer. Right. Any experiences with the wildlife that uh, you kind of thought might get a little dicey? Um, yeah. Uh, well, the way Denali is set up, first of all, just to kind of frame things, is that there's a single road that goes deep into the park and they, they run a shuttle bus system on it. They use like these old school buses, like literally like old school and literally school buses <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that go up and down the road regularly. Uh, they do what's like tours up and down it and so on. But you basically have to ride the bus to get uh, deep into the park to get to some of these places. And essentially as a backpacker, you get your permit and you get your bus ticket and then you tell the driver, hey, let me off here. Um, there, there's no trails out there. Like they have some trails in the front country in Denali, um, but once you get beyond, I wanna say it's like the seven mile mark on the road. I, I, and I also wanna say the road's about 90 miles, but I could be grossly um, you know, mistaken <laughs> as far as that estimate, but it's a long road. The whole park's about the, state of, the size of the state of Massachusetts. Um, so you get deep out there and the driver drops you off and you just roam wherever you want. Um, it kind of teaches you the basics of plotting out your route on a map and kind of going beyond the kind of follow the numbers program of dialing up gut hook on a long trail and uh, just plugging away at that. Um, so you, you do off trail routes out there up and down river valleys primarily and then when you wrap up your trip, all you have to do is get back to the road and flag down a bus going, going homeward bound. And, you know, the driver sees, your, sees that you're a backpacker on the side of the road and uh, they'll, they'll take you back. Wow, that's a much different experience than uh, the usual trail hikes out there. I mean, you've got a, usually a well-marked trail. I know, you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot on the JMT and that's, I, I never had a question in my mind, am, am I on the trail or off the trail? But it sounds like uh, up in Denali, you, you get off the bus and just go where you want. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Wow. Um, so I, I hiked and backpacked up there uh, pretty much every weekend that summer when I was up there, cause I wanted to make the most of it, of course. And 
often uh, we'd see grizzly bears from the buses. Um, but on foot, I didn't see a single grizzly bear for the entire season until the very last backpacking trip um, when uh, my partner and I saw probably about a half dozen in like two hours. We were crossing this expanse of tundra and the blueberries were ripe. Um, but the very first one we saw, like, um, it, we were kind of under Mount McKinley, at, like, or nearby it, I should say, and there was a great view of it. Uh, you can't even see the mountain most of the time because it's covered in clouds. A lot of visitors are disappointed because of that. Uh, but it was a great day. We could see it. So I'm taking all these photos. I had my partner kind of pose for some. And I'm like, oh, look toward the mountain. And I'm, we're both looking toward the mountain for these photos. And then she turns around and she's like, Jamie, there, there's a bear behind you. <laughs> so it's a female with uh, two cubs. How's that for our first grizzly sighting? So I don't think that's good. <laughs> we start doing the textbook, like back up and wave your arms over your head to kind of identify yourself as a human and say, hey, bear, and all that. And um, as soon as we kind of did that, the mama bear whips her head around and looks at us and then turns her head forward and keeps on going with her little cubs in tow. And that was that. But then after that, we had to cross this field of uh, blueberries and, like I said, encountered uh, like four or five more bears. Probably just four, I think it was. But uh, most of those were from a much safer distance. And they were all single male bear, bears, presumably. Wow, that's pretty dicey. Pretty dicey. Did you ever see the documentary uh, Grizzly Man? I have, yeah. That's it very entertaining. Yeah, it didn't end well. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, no. but uh, yeah, a pretty wacky documentary. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, what is this guy thinking? Um, it's worth noting, though, that um, the moose in Denali are more deadly than the grizzly bears. I think I've heard that, yep. In the entire history of Denali National Park, there's only been one incident where a bear killed somebody. And it was a photographer, and they recovered his camera, and when they looked at his pictures, they saw that he was, frankly, kind of asking for it, approaching the bear for better photos. So that, that's a good track record for safety, though, as far as bears in that park. I'm waiting to hear the corresponding stat on how many tourists have been killed by moose. <laughs> um, I want to say it's around 20. Okay. I don't so, know that one off the top of my head. So, I mean, just with those numbers, you know, moose are 20 times more deadlier. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh they don't care, you know, especially, again, the females with, with the, the young ones. Uh, they see you, and if they don't like you, they'll just trample. They'll just charge and, and trample and kick and... Moose are very large. <laughs> yeah, for, for some of our listeners who maybe have not uh, been in the presence of a moose, how large are they? Where, where, did, where did Jamie's head come up to them on, on uh, you know, in terms um, of their shoulder or flank or what? Yeah, up to the shoulder probably. Ooh, that's, that's a large animal. At best. Yeah. I'd probably have to jump to see over a moose's back. Yeah. Wow. We could rest their chin on the, on the roof of like, you know, a big old SUV, no problem, you know, or big old like, you know, truck even. Right. Like up truck. Hey, let's talk about uh, duct tapes first love, or, or, or I was, was going to say first love, maybe not first love, duct tapes uh, main love these days, uh, the Grand Canyon. Is that your favorite place to be? Uh, it is for sure. Um, it was my first park job. I moved out there in 2008. And yeah, it's just, it's like a mountain range inverted. Like for, um, like you love the Sierra Nevada, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, just imagine the Sierra Nevada flipped over, turned upside down. So it just creates a labyrinth. And it's all just red rock cliffs and desert and uh mostly the route finding too is what gets addicting down there 
because yeah, you, you have your trails in the canyon, you know, you have the classic rim to rim corridor, that, that's the big bucket list hike that uh, draws the most people. And then you have your other backcountry hikes that get off more uh, like off the beaten track, but um, it's a really large park and it's when you start exploring off the trails in Grand Canyon that it really becomes addicting and consuming. Um, because the way it's set is you have these bands of cliffs, of course, and there's only certain areas where you can get through those cliffs, so it becomes a kind of puzzle, um, picking out your routes and managing water. Um, there's a lot of inner canyon peaks too, like like little summit, basically like mountain peaks within the canyon itself, so you can even get into peak bagging down there. Um, it's kind of got it all. And then, of course, at the bottom, there, there's the river, you know, which is a, an amazing journey, you know, whitewater rafting the Grand Canyon. <laughs> uh, that, right. that sounds good to just about anyone that loves the outdoors. Another thing about it um, that's kind of alluring is that when you backpack the canyon, you, you hike into the canyon. Like, you go in and suddenly like the whole world falls away the rest of the world is up there whereas even when you're in the mountains uh, unless you're in a really good like solid wilderness um you're looking down on roads and towns and uh you know a lot of them have developed towers and stuff on the peaks but when you get into the canyon just kind of everything else falls away and so make the case make the case for us here what why, so you, you've listed a couple things already, but uh, why should our next adventure be to the Grand Canyon and going in instead of being uh, out in the Sierras or on the Appalachian Trail somewhere? Uh, what is it that really drew you in? Um, just, well, it's an iconic location to begin with. You know, everyone says you got to go see the Grand Canyon. Um, you know, and I feel like most Americans should. Um, it's a kind of a, a humbling place. Uh, another thing about it is the, uh, the geology there, how the rock layers age as you get deeper into the canyon. And when you're down there, it just, it makes you feel really small, like even in, even in a way that the mountains can't do. Because um, the Grand Canyon just, uh, yeah, it reminds you of the, the ages of just of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And because you're going in and because you have those, those high Canyon walls, does it feel like it's uh, just a different world? Um, it does. Yeah. But what I'm trying to kind of get at here that I'm having a hard time dialing in um, is again, just the way it makes you feel small and it gives you a grasp of um, how long the earth has been around. For example, that even hum like humans as a species, how we won't be around very long, I guess is the best way to sum it up. Um, like for example, we built dams on the Colorado River and in the scope of just the, the course of the Colorado River, those dams won't be around for very long at all, just in the blink of an eye. And in the Grand Canyon, that's a lot more tangible than I think most other hiking destinations, if not all of them. So geologic time you're talking about and our time on the planet is just a, a moment uh, compared to everything else. And exactly. so, yeah, I, I get that. I get that. That's, that's pretty poetic actually. And it kind of ties in with uh, my earlier comments about, you know, looking forward and looking backward and trying to live in the moment. Uh, it's probably magnified in, in that situation. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. Very good. So how many miles, you said earlier, you, you've done a lot of miles in the Grand Canyon. Yeah, about 4,000, I'd say. Wow. Give or take. Uh -huh. what, what, is the, what is the longest trail that you've done uh, in and about the Grand Canyon? Um, well, the longest trail in the canyon is, is only about 100 miles. It's the Tonto Trail. And that kind of runs the length of the canyon. It, it parallels the, the rim and the river. So you've done the equivalent of 40 Tonto trails. Yeah. <laughs> wow. 
And um, what, what, what time frame has, did you do those 4,000 miles in I mean, over the course of how many years? Um, beginning in 2008 until today. Um, the longest hike I did in the canyon, uh, which I'll touch on here briefly, uh, was 36 days, I think. It was 35 or 36 days um, solo. And in that time, I never came out of the canyon. Um, in reality, on that trip, I, I spent a total of 55 days below the rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, without coming out, getting a shower or a restaurant meal or anything, because I started it out as a whitewater rafting trip. I've been down the river four times. Um, it was on a private permit, and that was a 21-day trip. And then along that trip, I had um, like pickle buckets, like paint buckets, you know, like you get at Home Depot, mm -hmm. uh, filled with caches. And I dropped those off at strategic locations in the canyon. And then at the end of that river trip, there at the takeout, um, I had a friend of mine uh, take me across the river uh, on an inflatable raft. And then I started backpacking back up the canyon for, uh, yeah, like 36 days. I was going to ask you about your resupply strategy, but uh, <laughs> very, very well done. Nice. So, yeah, that, that's an example of, of how much I love it down there. And I, I'd probably do something like that again. Very good. And you did it all solo? The, the hiking part? I the did, backpacking? yeah. Um, uh, my girl came in to, to visit me once, and she joined me for about three days on that. Um, and it's worth noting on the entirety of that trip, I saw only one other backpacking party. Um, I did see some other people, but they were, they were rafters on the river. So pretty much no other hikers out there either. Wow, that had to be an epic experience. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> and what does the night sky look like from the Grand Canyon? Uh, amazing. Dark skies out there, for sure. <laughs> uh, you can see the Milky Way uh, regularly. It's, the Milky Way is bright out there, to give you an idea. And do you have any photos of the Milky Way on either your... Uh... Instagram or your website? Um, I do not. I never really got into night sky photography mm -hmm. too deeply. Um, I've taken some photos of the Milky Way, but uh, none that I was ever really super proud of, you could say. <laughs> yeah, I've, you know, my only equipment out there, my only, my camera equipment is my iPhone. And so uh, uh -huh. I, I've, I've looked at the sky and said, oh, this is so beautiful. I take a picture of it and it's just a black screen. So I never, never got the, the right equipment or the right technique to, to be a, a, an effective night photographer either. <laughs> All right. Hey, any other stories from the Grand Canyon? Um, yeah, there's a bunch, but <laughs> I don't think we have time for all those. Okay. So before we get to the Hayduke Trail, which is uh, also very much of interest to me, um, let me ask, you know, why? Why? You, you, I mean, you have these incredible epic trips and it takes a lot of time. It takes uh, a, a, a lot of determination. Um, why do you do it? Why do the AT? Why do the Grand, why do 4,000 miles on, on the, uh, in the Grand Canyon? Why do the, the bike pack, uh, the bike tour? Uh, I just enjoy it. Um, yeah, that, that's the big question, isn't it? Uh, it is. I did mention earlier, I, I had a pretty solid uh, kind of bucket list. You, I hate the term bucket list, but we all use it nowadays, so I'll, I'll stick with it. But anyway, I had that list of things even uh, before I finished high school that I wanted to do that were kind of in that vein of uh, outdoor exploration and kind of you could call it an endurance sport, I guess. Um, but yeah, kind of getting back to what you said earlier, it helps you kind of live in the moment and life is simple and good out there. Any interest in like Everest, Everest Base Camp? Everest Base Camp, yes. Uh, Mount Everest, absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> and for our listeners, draw. what, what is the distinction between the two? What's, what's, 
I think when, when people hear Everest Base Camp, they're thinking oh, that's, that's top of Everest. Um, that's where the climbers, uh, that's base camp for the climbers that summit Mount Everest. Uh, that's where their teams are. It's basically like a small city, I imagine, in climbing season. I've never been there. Um, but yeah, it's base camp for the, the mountain climbers that top out on Mount Everest. Um, it's not, it's not like a, exactly a city. You have to do some backpacking to get there but there's a little huts and supply stations along the way to get to it. But it, in climbing season, they have, you know, helicopters that go in and out of there, for example, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 18,000 feet, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it sounds right. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the Hayduk Trail. Um, yeah, the, the Hayduk Trail caught my eye. Uh, you know, back in the in the 2000s, after pretty much when I first heard, heard of it, I thought, oh, that sounds really cool. Uh, so it was always in the back burner. Um, but after uh, moving to the, the Grand Canyon and kind of doing a lot of hikes there, I, I ended up hiking a lot of the, the Hayduk Trail's route through the canyon. Um, I've done pretty much all the Hayduk Trail through the canyon. Uh, I did that first, and then um, in fact, I've actually walked the, the entire length of Grand Canyon from where it begins, where the river trips start at Lee's Ferry, to uh, where the river trips end at Pierce Ferry, the length of that national park. So what I got it in mind to do was to do a hike that would begin at the confluence of the Colorado River and the Green River in Wyoming, which is a major landmark up in Canyonlands National Park. And it just so happens that the Hayduke Trail pretty much goes right to that spot. So in, uh, it was the fall of 2016, uh, when I put together a hike utilizing the majority of the Hayduke Trail from that spot to connect it to Lee's Ferry, um, where the Grand Canyon begins. So I've done the majority of the Hayduke Trail, not all of it. Um, I don't really desire to kind of through hike the entire Hayduke Trail. Because uh, there are some parts that just don't look a lot of fun, specifically the, the Arizona Strip connecting the end of the Grand Canyon to Zion at the end. And uh, because I've section hiked most of it already, um, I don't see myself going to the trouble of, of doing the whole thing as a through hike or anything like that. But I, I have walked the majority of Hayduke Trail. Um, Again, it's just a, an off-trail experience, uh, similar to what I had described off-trail in Denali and Grand Canyon. Um, it is a, a lot more programmed nowadays as far as like following the route and information that's out there. Um, but again, you're still um, off-trail for a good bit of it, just following canyons. For the most part, you're, on, you're either on a trail, on the Hayduke Trail, or you're following a canyon or you're going cross country and connecting a trail to a canyon or vice versa. Yeah, I watched the documentary, Figuring It Out on the Hayduke Trail. Have uh -huh. you seen that? I have, yeah. Yeah, and there, you're right. There are parts of it that didn't look like uh, a whole lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> there, you know, I, I think that the title kind of gives some insight. I mean, you're, you're, you're figuring out where you are and where you have to go, but you know, there's also people on that trail who, you know, like on any, any long trail, they're figuring themselves out and wrestling with, you know, life issues and getting to the bottom of things. But uh, yeah, there are definitely some parts on that trail where you're like, okay, am I on the trail? Am I near the trail? It, there is no trail here. I've just got to blaze my own way. And I think in the, in the documentary, they, they took a wrong turn, went into the wrong Canyon, had to come back up and out of it. And, uh, it seems like it would be very frustrating for me. But that's part of it on the Hayduke. Um, it, it, it's, it's essentially just a route that a few guys put together uh, back in the late 90s or early 2000s. And um, they, they wanted to make it a long distance trail, like a national scenic trail, but they discovered there's a lot of red tape and <laughs> so on with getting something like that designated. Uh, especially because it goes through a number of national parks and so on, you can imagine. Um, so they just thought, well, let's just put it out there anyway. We've done all this work and we'll call it the Hayduke Trail. Uh, so that's what they did. And it's catching on a bit. 
Um, so but because it doesn't have that designation, there's not a lot of uh, trail work or trail maintenance that gets done on it. There's not a lot of signage. No, not at all. And I hope there never is out in that country because that, that's kind of the point of it. Got it. Got it. And so what, what is duct tape figuring out out there when he's on the trail? Do you, are you, have you figured yourself out? What have you learned about yourself? Oh, um, just that it doesn't take much to uh, be happy. I figured that out on the Appalachian Trail uh, on my first backpacking trip. Um, just because I had some, you know, at, at that age, I, I already had some of the best days of my life on the Appalachian Trail. And um, just to, to have that experience with so little, you know, just to be dirty and stinky and being carrying only what's on your back and to still be having the time of your life uh, kind of really spoke to me and taught a great lesson. Well said. I like that a lot. That's great. Uh, of all the 10,000 miles, uh, were there any uh-oh moments out there where you thought, what have I gotten myself into? And I don't, I don't ask this question to, I think maybe my listeners think that I asked this just for the, the sensationalism of, you know, oh, danger. But I, I ask just as maybe it might be a, a, a lesson for our listeners that, you know, you, you found yourself in a situation because of uh, maybe some, some missteps and you're able to extract yourself out of it. So any, any times where you're on the trail and you thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into here? Um, yeah, plenty of times. Um, the first one that comes to mind is a Grand Canyon story, of course. Uh, um, you're not supposed to hike the Grand Canyon in the summer, pretty much, is what the lesson is that this boils down to. Because uh, it gets down to about, or it gets up to like 110 degrees, 115 at the bottom of the canyon in July, June, July, August. Um, and there's a lot of elevation change. It's about 5,000 feet from the rim to the river. Um, so my first summer out there in 2008, um, I didn't know that I was going to be ending up there for years and years. So I thought I just had this one summer to make the most of. So I hiked the canyon a lot that summer and dealt with the heat. I was in my late 20s and um, I was a pretty strong hiker then and, and thought I could deal with it. Um, so I went down to the bottom one day down to uh, Phantom Ranch and back up on the main trails. Uh, that's about an 18 mile day. And again, I mentioned about 5,000 feet down, 5,000 feet up, hot weather. And that actually went pretty well. So I was feeling really good about myself after that. And I thought, oh, this place isn't so dangerous or bad after all. So I got out my map and started looking at all these other hikes I could do. And I saw a trail on the map called the, the New Hans Trail. And it's a lot shorter. It's only about six miles down to the river and back. So I thought, okay, that should be no problem. I'll, I'll go do that uh, one day. So I went out there. Uh, there's no water on that trail. I, I packed about six liters to get me through the, through the day. Um, got dropped off, headed down, and that trail's a lot more rugged than the main trails, but I like that about it. I was like, yeah, this is a real trail. I'm getting out in, into some better wilderness here. This is great. So I keep going and keep going, and um, I get down to the river, and um, you know, it's time to turn around and head back up. And on the way down, I had drank uh, more than half of my water, probably about four out of those six liters, just going downhill. Mm -hmm. And I still had to climb all the way back up and out. Um, the river, uh, the Colorado River runs like brown in the summer because it carries a lot of sediment. So it's really a pain to purify it, um, to get the, the silt to settle if you can. And I didn't have a filter or... I use Aquamira. Um, I didn't bring any of that that day like an idiot. Um, so I start heading back up and um, I mentioned it's a more rugged trail. So I'm following this canyon at first away from the side canyon away from the river at first. And I miss the trail and uh, get off trail and I can't find the spot where the trail leaves um, the side canyon called Red Canyon. So I knew I was low on water and I knew I wasn't in a very good situation. So 
that was definitely kind of an uh-oh moment. Um, I was kind of scrambling on the sides of these canyons and or on the side of the side canyon and kicking down rocks and stuff, getting into some bad spots, thinking, what am I doing out here? Um, by the time I got near the rim of the canyon, it was after dark. Um, I'd ran out of water long ago and I was in such bad condition that I could only go about five or 10 steps at a time before I'd have to stop and lie down flat on my back and just catch my breath and uh, try not to fall asleep also and just kind of gather up the strength to get up and go five more steps and repeat the process. And doing that, I, I slowly but surely did make my way back up to the top. And um, yeah, the, the kicker on top of that was that by then it's like 10 or 11 at night and I had to hitchhike back home to where I lived in, <laughs> at the Grand Canyon Village. Fortunately, like the like second or third car stopped for me and gave me a ride. Took pity on you. My goodness. <laughs> so yeah, there's an uh-oh moment for you. For sure. Wow. All right. Hey, duct tape, you know where we are? Where are we? We are at that point in the episode where I look to you and say, what is your pro tip insight of the week? What can you share with our listeners to make their next adventure that much better? Um, I'd say uh, to be mindful of your cell phone use on the trail. Uh, we've been talking about living in the moment out there and kind of talking tonight about kind of how things, um, how these hikes were for me. It makes me think of how things have changed on the trail and it kind of gets into sort of hike, hike your own hike territory. Um, I'm not saying phones are bad, you know, I'd, I'd take a cell phone if I was going to through hike another trail, but just to be kind of mindful of how, how you're using it. Um, it. It's great to have have like like the gut hook app and have your camera and I'd, I'd use it to keep my journal and, and so on. It, it solves a lot of problems. But for example, like like there's the, the Facebook groups you get every year now that's like class of 2021 for example. There's probably one like that for the PCT and for all the long trails. So you get folks going on those to plan beforehand, which is great. But once you're on the trail, kind of staying connected via that and just thinking about things that kind of bring you away from the trail changes the experience. Um, again, I'm not saying that's, you know, evil, you know, but uh, for folks that are going out on a long distance hike, um, it's you want to be mindful of kind of why you're out there like because for me a lot of it is just getting away from it all you know and getting away from your everyday worries and stuff and if you're out there on a long trail and you get to a ridge and you think oh wow there's great views here both ways um i bet this is a great place to get cell coverage and you open up your phone and start doing email and doing social media and all this stuff. Um, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, you know, good, you know, like <laughs> to each their own. But I think for a lot of folks, uh, there's a danger of winding up getting into that mindset without deliberately doing so because we're all attached to our phones nowadays. And um, it's just kind of, almost like a, a pitfall I think uh, folks should be aware of falling into. So that's my tip. <laughs> Great tip. Great tip. Stay disconnected. Enjoy the moment. Stay in the moment. Awesome. So there you have it. That's it. Season two, episode four is in the books. I hope our listeners enjoyed our time with duct tape. I want to thank him for joining us this week. How can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates on your latest adventures, duct tape? Um, well, my website, of course, uh, downthetrail.com. Um, I do have an email list on there, which is probably best. Um, as far as social media, um, I deactivated my Facebook back in September, so I'm not on social media at not all. Not on social media. Wow. Um, I might get back on in the future. Um, but yeah, so for now, it's just the website and, and the email list to find me. 
Got it. You you are a rare breed. <laughs> Remember to check out the pod on social media as well. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at johnfreakinmuir at gmail.com. Duct tape, I'm looking to give our listeners uh, your recommendations for a book, a movie, a documentary, a website, or a YouTube channel that will keep them connected to outdoor adventures. We're calling this our, our uh, adventure media recommendation of the episode. Do you have anything that you can direct our listeners to? Um, well, we're on the John freaking mirror pod. So, um, I, I think a great book relating to the John Muir trail is, uh, called the last season by Eric Blem. Um, you, you've probably heard that before on this podcast. <laughs> Actually, this is the first time. So I've, I've made a note and I'm going to pick that up. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a classic, uh, nowadays for, as far as the outdoors and the Sierra Nevada, um, the story in the book is it's part bi biography uh, because it's about a backcountry ranger in uh, Kings Canyon, Sequoia, who would work out there in the backcountry seasonally at all the little ranger stations you come across the, along the JMT. And he's a badass ranger. Uh, in particular, when people like go missing and go into trouble with, with search and rescue, um, he's the pro. He, he's the guy that, that's great at finding them. Wait a and second. Then, does, he, does he go missing? Exactly. I take, it, I, take, I take back my earlier statement because uh, Barney Scout Mann, who wrote the PCT memoir, um, Journeys North, told us about this. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the book is, uh, it's, it's a chapter of biography, and then, so he goes missing, and then it's uh, biography and then the story of the search for him and then more biography and the story of the search for him and so on just uh, back and forth chapters that kind of touch on both those things nice good uh, recommendation good. yeah all right thank you that's a wrap from the john freaking mirror studio any final thoughts or shout outs to uh, friends family former trail mates um no, not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for tuning. Go to, ahead. To the visit to my website, uh, the folks that read the Long Trail Journal and the Colorado Trail Journal specifically, the, the ones that enjoy my journals, I really appreciate that. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if it's 10 p.m. and you're out of water and you've got to hitchhike back home. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck. <laughs>